Hello, Anglosphere Society. Welcome to our discussion today with Congressman Jeff Fortenberry of the 1st District of Nebraska. And I am Nina Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom of the Hudson Institute, where I'm a senior scholar. And it's my honor to be addressing um, a stalwart in uh, advancing religious freedom, Congressman Fortenberry. He is the dean of the congressional delegation in, um, for Nebraska. And he is also uh, a member of the powerful Appropriations Committee, where he is a member of the Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. He's also the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Agricultural, Agriculture and Rural Life. So welcome. Well, thank you, Nina, so much. Thanks for the generous uh, introduction. And let me also say thank you to Amanda Bowman for inviting me to New York. I'm sorry I couldn't join you there for the Anglosphere Society. I understand Cardinal Dolan will be a part of it. Uh, uh, I told Nina, Amanda, a few moments ago, I have a little funny story about Cardinal Dolan. Uh, one time I was in New York, simply knocked on the door, wanted to see him. He called back, and, you know, we, I was able to see him, and it was a Saturday morning, and he uh, said, Jeff, come on in. I'm batching it today. You want a donut? So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, Jeff, you played a really pivotal role on, in Iraq, and... Um, you were a leader on the genocide resolution, and then you continued to do work on the situation in Iraq, particularly as it affected the religious minorities. Please describe what you did then. Well, first of all, I watched in horror as ISIS's twisted dark ideology uh, targeted innocent people, the Christian community, the Yazidi community, certain Muslim minority communities. And um, you go into public service because it's a call in the heart. There's other ways to make a living, but you do the same thing. You're here in Washington because you want to make a, a broad difference in terms of the common good, the public good. So when you sit by, especially after all the trauma that we've gone through in Iraq, all the, the troops that we've lost, all the money that we spent, um, all the funerals I had attended for service members from Nebraska who died, when you see th that situation collapsing, this uh, fundamental assault on human dignity, it just compels you to action. The other dynamic, too, honestly, was when I first got to Congress, I had worked on an issue. It was uh, expanding the special immigrant visa program for mm -hmm. translators. And many of the Yazidi religious minority community were our translators in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Some had mm -hmm. died. Some had stood side by side. They were under grave threat. Their families mm -hmm. were under grave threat. I had, and interestingly, a lot of those Yazidi community members made their home in Nebraska, just an odd coincidence. So I knew the community, and it's a quiet community in Iraq, but it's also it's a quiet, contained community in, in Nebraska who have beautifully integrated, though, into our culture. They, mm -hmm. they uh, are, are people who celebrate their own religious tradition, are very open to the community, contribute to the community, and wave the American flag, very proud mm -hmm. Americans. And I remember so vividly one day that a number of those young men who had gotten their visas to come here came into my office. And I'd, again, I'd known the community for mm -hmm. years when Mount Sinjar was under attack. Yeah. You remember? Yeah. Uh, shocking. Uh, sho it was, yeah, absolutely uh, the, shocking. And, and they're crying. They're, they're angry. They're almost yelling at me, Congressman, my, my mother, my mother, she's there. They Do had something. 6,000 women were taken yeah. as slaves. And that was the other trauma. Uh, not only was it people being killed, especially the men, but women being taken as sex slaves. Uh, um, and it, it was just so traumatic, knowing that community, uh, seeing, uh, again, all that we had done in Iraq, watching it on the verge of mm -hmm. collapse because of the darkness of I ISIS, that we went to work. We took one resolution, reworked it right quick, and. I'm hopeful that that was a part of President Obama's decision. This was the genocide resolution well, this, holding Well, this ISIS. this was the first. Remember, President Obama came in and bombed Mount Sinjar, mm -hmm. saved a lot of lives, mm -hmm. or bombed the ISIS, ISIS contingent. Yeah. And uh, and then after that, we began to work on the the uh, resolution declaring what happened to be genocide. Mm -hmm. And I, honestly, I remember I brought this up in the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee. Secretary of State John Kerry at the time was before the committee. And he pulled me aside afterward because I, I, I pressed on the issue. I pressed on it uh, diplomatically. There had been some resistance to it. Um, and we talked about it privately on the side. 
So we tried uh, very aggressively to make this bipartisan, which eventually it was, um, and uh, got it through the State Department that this was a genocide. And that has particularly meaning, for, particular mm -hmm. meaning for international law, but it also gave us the ability to begin to reconstruct mm -hmm. some things. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the Trump administration came in, and Vice President Pence had a particular sensitivity to this set, set of issues as well, being a real fighter for the ideals of religious freedom all over the world. And working with his office and Mick Mulvaney as well, um, we're able to move some funds in USAID into Well, that was rebuilding. the key thing, is because mm -hmm. the um, victims, the, the biggest victims, the Yazidis and the Christians of the ISIS genocide in northern Iraq, were uh, then neglected. They, they didn't receive, they weren't receiving U.S. aid um, for several years. We were very afraid that the multilateral organizations where our aid had traditionally traversed UN, through yeah. wouldn't be as sensitive to this as we wanted them to be. Yeah. So we just basically took it on ourselves. And that was important because I gave it, I think it gave a little bit of hope. And in fact, around the same time, interestingly, the, there was a young man, a young woman, excuse me, um, who was on the Today Show yesterday. And uh, she had been an intern for me. <laughs> I had received a letter from her when she was 15 or 16 years old. Mm. She was one of these villagers who came home mm -hmm. to find chaos, people running and screaming everywhere. What's the matter? ISIS is coming. They all jumped on the car and in the car and just got away as soon as they could. And then this long journey to America took place and she landed in my town and went to school and didn't have perfect English ability, but wrote me a beautiful letter and mm -hmm. the English that she had. And I told my district director, let's, let's give her an internship. Every Christmas holiday, she came to volunteer with us. Summer, she worked with us. She ended up giving the commencement address at her high school graduation, went on as a student at Creighton University and uh, was on the Today Show that's yesterday. A gr that's a great story. But it demonstrates, yeah, yeah. We it, shouldn't lose sight of the individuals I, and all oh of this. Oh, my goodness. She's an uh, incredible young woman who, I wish I had that letter with me. Uh, maybe I can send it to Amanda. Maybe you guys could read it up there because uh, it is so powerfully written. And mm -hmm. like saying, you, are, Congressman, you are my only hope and all mm -hmm. these th things that are way over the yeah. top. But it was so nope. touching to me. Who is it says that it, you know a, a thousand people dead is a right. statistic and right. one person is a tragedy? I right. mean, it's that one face, that personality, right. and that brings us to the great tragedy, another genocide today in China uh, by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, against the Uyghur Muslim ethnic minority. And um, are there lessons from your? efforts on the Iraq situation um, to improve U.S. policy, actually, aid policy and uh, acknowledgement that this was going on. Are there lessons to be learned on China? Uh, the, the, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is there are certain more fundamental problems here and how to address that. And, and I'll, give you re I'll give you the answer. So uh, I have five daughters. And the <laughs> One of the vehicles we have has 200,000 miles on it, and its tires were worn out. So I went to the tire store. I said, listen, the tires are going to outlive the car. Give me the cheapest tires you have. <laughs> and I said, how much? They said $480. I said, where were those tires made? China. Mm -hmm. How much are the American tires? $580. Yeah. Give me the American yeah. tires. In other words, <laughs> you know, we, we will have this incredible discussion. Anglosphere Society will have this incredible conference, which is all essential for, again, continuing to sensitize us mm -hmm. to this fundamental principle of civilization, namely human dignity, mm -hmm. from which flows rights, including religious freedom. Uh, without that philosophical proposition at work, you're, w what is it? What is your society? And you can look at China, it's this capitalistic, communistic hybrid that's controlled by ruling elites. And they're very conscious that they have a different model, and they think it's superior to Western democracy, and they want to export it. President Xi basically just told President Biden that. Yeah. See, your, your system doesn't work. Right. Ours does. Now, I wasn't in the room, but I heard that from some of my Democratic colleagues. So you're saying that our and we underwrite exporting it. our manufacturing Correct. And, and technology and allowing them to steal our technology, our intellectual property, um, has really hurt us and strengthened them to do... The uh, corporate industrialist 
abstract notion of free trade empowered manufacturing to move there, take advantage of lax labor laws, lax environmental standards, government subsidies, direct and indirect, that have actually created an unlevel playing field. Mm -hmm. And so this, again, free trade economics doesn't work unless you have compatible systems. So they're effectively getting a 20% or higher discount on the manufacturing of their goods because here we try to protect our environment, we try to protect labor. And because we have a system designed, even though we don't articulate it, around this idea that every person matters. Mm -hmm. uh, human dignity is the philosophical tenet mm -hmm. that creates justice mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. political and economic and social systems, even though that's under stress. There, again, that's traded off for a little semblance of freedom as long as you obey. Mm -hmm. And we just keep underwriting that by buying the stuff, just buying the stuff, and we'll send our ships over there and our military personnel in harm's way keep those shipping lanes open. Hmm. All in the name of this abstract notion of democracy while it's the corporate industrialists who profit off of all of this. And we go along with it by buying the cheap stuff. Mm -hmm. So you want to stop it fundamentally. You recognize that that's an unfair subsidy. They have an unfair subsidy mm -hmm. by profiteering multinational corporations mm -hmm. that create cheaper goods for us Mm -hmm. undermining the principles of human rights, democracy, human mm -hmm. dignity, and frankly, giving rise to this Chinese nationalism, which is their reason for being. Mm -hmm. now, I, I've been to China. I was treated very well. And it was interesting in one of the hotel we were in was a state-owned enterprise. Mm -hmm. And one of the Chinese economists was very probing with us. Mm -hmm. He was in the meeting. He said, do you like this hotel? It's a lovely hotel. Have they treated you very well? They treated me very, very fondly. Thank you. Uh, what's the difference between this hotel and your hotels in America? I think the service is comparable. This is a state-run enterprise. Mm -hmm. Do you see our point? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's their yeah. argument. I think the American people got a little glimpse of this and, and were horrified with the, uh, during the uh, pandemic, um, China's unethical behavior of you know, stopping its own planes from spreading the virus inside the country, but letting the international planes go out to spread it to the four corners of the world, but also our pharmaceuticals and our uh, hospital supplies, our medical supplies are being sourced or elements of it are being sourced from China. The supply yeah. chain is dependent on China. The unbelievable irony of the place of the source of the virus is one of the main manufacturers of, of, of yeah, protective equipment. Yeah. And China controls, controls quite a bit of mm -hmm. pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, and then the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, over which I have authority, mm -hmm. ha they can do spot inspections of our plants here. Again, back to this unlevel playing field. And we, plant managers, corporations, mm -hmm. good corporations here have to let them in. There, no. Mm -hmm. They've been delayed or they have, they have to give them forewarning. And what kind of sense does that make? Mm -hmm. Again, an unlevel playing field. Um, so pharmaceutical, look, the, the answer is made in America. You want to stop all this or make a huge contribution? to returning, again, a consciousness about the importance of human rights and dignity and the right types of economic system that are consistent with human rights and dignity, you have to demand mm -hmm. that this, if we're going to trade, the systems mm -hmm. have to be compatible. Um, my colleague, uh, Senator Ben Sass, has also called for what, he, what I call segmented decoupling. In other words, it, it, sensitive manufacturing of chips and devices is finished, broad-based Commodity movements like we export from Nebraska, mm -hmm. particularly a lot of agricultural products, particularly soybeans, to uh, China. But that, again, that's base consumption that mm -hmm. we are better at in producing than, than they are because of our natural resources and the expertise of our farmers. Um, and that might be a way to get us back to some, some normalcy mm -hmm. without underwriting their vast war machine, their vast economic machine and their intentionality around the world. And, yeah. and as I've said, their foreign policy is resource extraction, payment to authoritarian regimes, mm -hmm. and um, predatory lending. Now, what, what, what does any of those make sense in terms of the fundamental idea of keeping stability in the world, a normalized economic mm -hmm. system, a normalized political system that protects human rights, human dignity? Mm -hmm. Well, human dignity is certainly being violated um, in orders of magnitude through uh, organ transplant, uh, organ harvesting on demand in China. 
And this is something that has been swirling around China's reputation for uh, two decades. And China very effectively um, defeated it, I think, by going to the UN, going to the WHO, and starting an ethics committee on organ transplants and funding it. And so redefine uh, the terms. It redefine the if terms. If you have the money. But the UN, uh, to their credit, to the, uh, 12 special envoys or special rapporteurs on human rights issues came together at the UN this past summer and issued a, a statement saying that this practice now ha is credibly evidenced. We have seen you know, the Torture Committee, the Women's Committee, um, Detentions Committee uh, have found that religious minorities across the board now are being targeted for forced har organ transplants, um, forced organ harvesting um, on demand in the detention centers, the black jails the, the, where people, where religious prisoners are put without any kind of due process or trial for an indefinite period of time. So they um, take blood samples, they do sonograms and put it in a government database. And when someone in need of an organ transplant from around the world comes in, um, it's called transplant tourism, they, they know where to go to get the living organ, to get the, to, to kill, to execute, basically, these detainees. The UN said that they were, um, they were almost exclusively from religious minorities across the board. And that's Falun Gong, of course, but all, which has been going on a long time, um, but also the Uyghur Muslims, also the Christians, also the Tibetan Buddhists. Can Congress do anything about that? Is there, you know, people well, have talked about yes. excluding the transplant doctors that participate or excluding journals that publish them or... Well, I'm glad you're raising this issue with me. I mean, the, the spectrum of assaults on human dignity are so grave. Of course, we've focused on the mm -hmm. earlier, the forced abortion policies mm -hmm. in China and the size limitation on families, which they've lifted to some degree because they recognize their... Mm -hmm demographic problem, and particularly the male-female imbalance that's occurred because yes. of this. Yeah. And so that's been a particular area of focus. Uh, I'm aware of what you're saying, but not to that degree. And mm -hmm. But you're teaching me something that, at, at least at the UN, there's enough sensitivity to this to begin to push back. And, and again, back to the importance of your work in this conference, um, sensitizing conscience and keeping this ever present and ever alive has got to be uh, an essential part of our work. Um, are there sanctions? Are there? I, I'd have to I'd have to think through that uh, to give you a more specific answer. Mm -hmm. And if you want to use the resources of the Hudson Institute here to help us with that, yeah, I'd, sure. I'd be grateful. But again, I think what you're saying and what you described is so strike, striking and jarring. Mm -hmm, it would mm -hmm. it, most people would be sensitive to this. Well, it ties in with, with what you were saying too, because it's. Um, completely beyond ethics, you right. know, of all ethical considerations um, and any kind of rights, um, they're uh, excelling at transplants. People can get whatever organ they need at any time. All they have to do is show up in China. And they, so they're effectively exporting our organs. Mm -hmm. the, you mean around the world? Anybody well, came from around the world can go to China? Yes, wow. yeah, yeah. So, um, and they, it's very hidden that these yeah. are, but when 12 separate experts in human rights at the UN, and these are experts in various areas of human rights, come together and all say the evidence is so compelling and so credible, we can no longer keep silent. And that just happened, I think, in June of this year. That And, and it... It um, sank without a trace, you know, that, that their, their statement, which was published by the UN on a, pr a UN press release, um, made, no made no dent in yeah. the business of the UN. They, the Human Rights Com Commission, a Council, which is uh, tasked with, with that kind of thing, uh, just declined to take it up and China sits on it. Well, again, you, you have to ask yourself, where does the power to do that come from? 
comes from, and it comes from resource control. And where does the resource control? Remember, they we we voted. I didn't, but before I was in Congress, they voted mm -hmm. to allow China into the World Trade Organization, which gave it legitimacy on the world stage. But you can't enter into an authentic trading relationship when you have incompatible systems, um, and frankly. It, incompatible ethics here, a mm -hmm. new type of ethic, an ethos that is governing that's very different. So what I've tried to emphasize is for the person who wants to do something, check the label on what you're buying. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's going to be more expensive in America. Mm -hmm. But we are effectively subsidizing this type of <laughs> grotesque indignity against humanity mm -hmm. when we do this. Now, is China a superpower? Yes. Are they going to remain a superpower? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it would be very helpful if America and had a much more robust transatlantic alliance and the philosophical underpinnings that come from us, and then we created a, 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 an alliance, if you will, in the Americas, which mm -hmm. has a semblance of that in their own cultures as well as it informs their own working system. It's familial. Mm -hmm. Inviting Africa, whose hearts lean our way, to join this broad mm -hmm. coalition of people who want to, again, base systems in this fundamental well, idea again, of human dignity. Well, again, they dignity. had this telecommunications um, export to Africa but, that is so this cheap is, and this so is tempting. The problem. It's and that, so tempting. And you know, um, I saw this in my own field of religious freedom. Do you know that most of American, overwhelming number of American Bibles now are printed in China? China is on the path of retranslating the Chinese language Bible or reinterpreting it to turn its meaning on its head, basically, with Jesus, in one case, uh, stoning the adulterous woman instead of uh, forgiving her. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's supposed to be, this new Bible is supposed to be out in a year or so. Um, but this, most publishers, Bible publishers in the United States uh, depend on one company, Amity Printing, in um, China to print its Bibles. And um, we have supply, or the United Bible Society has, from the West, has supplied it with the Bible paper for free. And all the parts for this massive 24-7 uh, printing machine came, were assembled from the West. And um, as a result, Bible publishers today are soft power assets of China. When President Trump imposed sanctions, uh, tariffs on um, tariffs on Chinese goods a couple years ago. They were in Washington lobbying against it. So it was a tariff on the word, huh? <laughs> <laughs> they said it, it, the Actually, tariffs defi deprived us of our First Amendment rights. Well, if that's so, have your Bibles printed in, elsewhere? Yeah, yeah. Almost anywhere else. I, I, it, I don't remember the name of the facility I went to, but I think I went to that place. And yeah. Of course, we were yeah. shown that for a reason. You see, mm -hmm. we're, we've got these, mm -hmm. they're free to print what they like. I wasn't aware of the possible manipulation of the scripture. You're, you're teaching me a lot today, <laughs> well, Nina. But look, it's, it's replete with problems. Uh, are we going to have to find a way to peacefully coexist and engage what, in what trade can and exchange? What do, Jeff, to sum up? You, you, yeah. you can pass a resolution highlighting... You can hold a hearing. Right. You brought Nadia Murad to the State of the Union to highlight an issue using, I think, effectively your bully pulpit. Yeah, Nadia Murad was a Yazidi woman Yazidi. who was yes. uh, captured into slavery, held in sex slavery by someone named Suleiman the Iraqi. I can't get it out of my head. And by the way, she escaped with the help of a Muslim family. Yeah, and, and uh, wrote a compelling book. And, and she, when she came to see us, First, it, she was really, I think, still in shock mm -hmm. by having yeah. not fully processed and healed from what had happened to her. And a Yazidi translator who was with her was just crying. The whole, we were all crying. When she, I asked her, I said, I'd like to know the fullness of your story. If you don't mm -hmm. want to tell me, I mm -hmm. understand, but I'd like to know. And she told us. Mm -hmm. um, that was purposeful because, again, to get this out of the abstract to the reality that mm -hmm. this is happening to real people, I told you the tire, me buying the tire story. I get it. I, you mm -hmm. know, I have the capability to pay a little more. A lot of people don't. And so they're going to have to take the cheaper good. But we've constructed a system here by which we sent the manufacturing there. They make the stuff. Mm -hmm. We buy the stuff. We run up debt, by the way. They buy the debt. They have our, because they have our mm -hmm. cash. 
And so we've got this dysfunctional marriage, this intertanglement mm -hmm. of economic systems that are inconsistent with the good of persons mm -hmm. uh, in the most fundamental ways here. It, it, it breeds a, a cheap materialism here. It doesn't compel, as was the argument 20 years plus years ago mm -hmm. when they came in the World Trade Organization, that a liberated economic system is going to bring about liberation yes. in the moral sphere. It didn't. It made it worse. It made it worse. And so. in fact, uh, one of the national security advisors uh, earlier said that to me. He said we were wrong. Well, um, I want to be considerate of your time. And thank you so much for coming down from the hill to the it's Hudson. called Made in America. Let's just go made back to America. Made in America. Yeah. Can I tell you one more story right quick? Sure. sure. So I have a 1963 Ford F-100 short bed, step side, John Deere green, three on the tree, standard transmission, pickup truck. <laughs> so when I went to go buy this, there's a long story there. I'd always wanted something like that. And men stopped me and they said, was it your grandfather's? No, it's <laughs> mine. I, I just wanted to go back to the tradition. But anyway, as I was struggling, when I was considering buying, I was struggling to get it out in the highway and grinding the gears. There was an old man sitting on the corner watching me. No power steering, no power brakes, and again, you're shifting mm -hmm. on the column. There's an old man watching this, and he looks at me, and he looks at the truck, and he looks back at me, and he goes. <laughs> and I've thought about that so much. What did he mean? Yeah, yeah. Because that truck reminded him of a previous age. Yes. Where that was built by American hands, and there was a certain pride in that skill set, if, mm -hmm. if you will. And mm -hmm. it symbolized... Dignity of work, yes. It, it's a cool truck in of itself, mm -hmm. and an antique, mm -hmm. and all that. But I think there was some deeper message in him doing that. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to use our economic system for ultimate mm -hmm. good, returning back to a strong economic system ourselves, where we produce and make our own things, where we innovate and we successfully compete, and through that return strength, we actually create the conditions in which we were to affect change for good elsewhere while trying to be good ourselves. Economics has a powerful, powerful role in all this. We can talk and we can conjole and we can mm -hmm. condemn and condone with words. But I spent the hundred extra dollars to buy the tire. I can't, I get it, not everybody mm -hmm. can do that, but I chose purposefully to do that mm -hmm. because of these considerations. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate your coming and sharing your stories and uh, your perspective from well, thank you, Capitol Nina. Hill. You do tremendous work from the heart because this is your vocation to try to save people worldwide. And I, I, I'm grateful. Well, thank you. And I want to thank our viewers, our audience, and um, see you next time.